Hello, Dave. Welcome to the Buy, Grow, Sell podcast. Simon, it's a great way to end my day here in the States. Well, and it's a lovely way to enjoy my middle of the day getting to chat to you. So thank you for making the time. Yeah. Well, anyway, it's, I've been looking forward to it. No, cool. Um, Dave, you've got a fascinating history. Um, you know, I, I can pretty much confirm that I don't think I've had any guests on our podcast that have started and sold a law practice and a software company. So you've already ticked the you know unique box here. So thank you. Um, maybe I could get you to just give us a little bit of your background. You know, like what sort of led you to starting your first business and whatnot, and you know, give the listeners a bit of background so they, so we can uh, build towards this uh, this journey. All right. Well, I'll just say buckle up because <laughs> the, the 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 part of the selling is probably the most mainstream part of my story because they had, <laughs> had a mainstream happy ending. But I was, uh, I'm from, you know, obviously I'm from the States and grew up in, in Pennsylvania and Pittsburgh. And um, when I was in college, I was 19 years old. My, my father died at a very young age at 50. And, and the reason I mentioned it is that um, after I graduated college, I went back home to Pittsburgh and uh, went to law school and was living with my mother who was quite, you know, just to kind of help her adjust. And in that journey, I ended up meeting a man who became a Zen teacher who became my spiritual teacher. And, and I, I have to tell you this story because it's the only way that anyone could ever understand how I ended up practicing law in a little town in West Virginia. Um, and I, I um, actually kind of had this dual life where after I graduated law school, I moved in with my teacher and was practicing law at the same time. And I was in a corrupt little town. I mean, really, when I say corrupt, I don't know. I don't know what the standard is where you are, but it was, you know, it was a it was a good old boy network. It was just, you know, just kind of corruption at every level you can imagine. And, and being the outsider, I was the only lawyer that would take cases that where you'd be fighting a judge or fighting the police or fighting whatever. But I also ended up building a very successful law practice at the same time that I was studying with my teacher. So I, so I, I bring this up because I've always had this dual interest of of high, you know, kind of like called spiritual matters or kind of higher matters or just philosophic matters. And also I just have a business sense. And one of the interesting things was, and I'm sure some of your listeners have found this, is that as soon as I opened my law practice, and we they don't teach you anything about being a lawyer in law school. You know, it's all of it's useless. And <laughs> as soon as I opened my as soon as I opened my practice, and literally I had no furniture, I had a rocking chair, not even a desk. I didn't know a soul. You know, I hate this. It sounds like, you know, a rags to riches story. I had enough money to pay rent for six months and nothing else. I literally had a thousand dollars and my rent was $150 a month and I didn't know anyone. And I just figured I wasn't going to, I was going to, you know, just persevere. And a lot of that was also because the man who was my, my teacher at the time was, was quite uh, fanatical, but very, very firm that, you know, you're, you're, your your life and your whatever your your your, your regular your business life and what one would call your spiritual life had to be one thing it had to be integrated. So the same kind of integrity, the same kind of determination and consistency and service that you want to that you kind of want to put towards your higher aspirations needed to go into business. And so anyway, it's a long winded way of saying I ended up building <laughs> almost in spite of myself I ended up building a really successful law practice. And yeah. I it took me fifteen years, but I was. You know, I was, I was making a ton of money. In fact, I was making so much money that my teacher just said, oh, you know, it's probably not even spiritual to make that much money. But, you know, that, that's a different podcast, a different time. But that's <laughs> West Virginia. That's how I ended up practicing law. And it was a combination of being um, a really good lawyer, which I was. I had an affinity for it, being having a lot of integrity, uh, having good partners and just sheer, sheer determination. Yeah. Dave, I'm, I'm curious because you sort of touched on there about having your your business life and your um, let's call it your greater personal life, you know, spiritual needs, who who you are as a human, um, being aligned. And I, you know, you sort of, I was thinking of the or, already. I wonder whether, well, he, it, well, here's the question: more is that I wondered whether this quest around your own personal discovery or in spiritual kind of foundations, did that have anything to do with leading you into the law and, and maybe a sense of justice or anything like that? That's a really, you know, I love it when someone asks a question I've been asked before and I actually have to come, you know, really think about, 
I, I don't know why I became a lawyer. You know, honestly, you know, if I would have to go back and backfill it and make it anyway, I, I feel that my sense of fairness and rightness and equity was, would infuse my practice and infuse my life. And, yeah, nice. and I, you know, and, and one thing in particular, I remember I had one case, I talked about corruption where I had a young man who was wrongly accused of a crime. And it was just, it was a prosecutor and a, and a you know, it was just really, I, it, it's a kind of, I actually wrote a book about it, you know, about my, wow. about my travels down there, but, but it was, it was, he was framed and he was convicted. And I knew that if that young man went to jail, I knew what would happen to him. I practiced law in the town where the state penitentiary was. And I knew, and my teacher said the same thing. He said, you know, it'll just wreck his, even his spiritual future because he'll be so abused in there. And I made up my mind. I was like, you know, I hate to sound like a fanatic, which I was, but I just said, this young man is not going to the penitentiary. And it's the only time that I remember, you know, being in the law library at three in the morning and having a janitor walk in and saying, what the hell are you doing here? And and interestingly enough, like two weeks after the conviction, our Supreme Court in the state where I was handed down a ruling, not on his case, but on another case that freed him from, you know. So it, it gave me this sense of, of the power of intentionality. And, you know, they don't, they don't always have happy endings. Most of my cases where I persevered did. But yes, I could not separate. I, I, and, it, and it's a great way to live. You know, this is part, maybe another podcast. Maybe not yours, or maybe another time you and I talk about it offline. But there's just a beautiful way that whatever shows up in your life is going to show up in your business. Whatever shows up in your business, and and wherever the incongruities are, wherever the misalignments are, something's not going to be right. And and, and we, 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 it'll show up in weird ways. You know, it won't necessarily show up in your business, but there'll be something that doesn't feel right, and you'll know that you just don't feel like you're standing on all fours. And so, in that sense, you know. And I, and I feel very fortunate just in retrospect. And I'll, I'll, I'll stop talking in a second. My trial lawyer comes out as soon as I, I can't stop talking as soon as I talk. I remember even being a lawyer. <laughs> but, but it's, I, I, I no longer can separate any, any facet of my life into a particular container. I no longer say, oh, this is my oh, spiritual life, or this is my marriage, or this is my business, or this is my mentoring, you know, whatever it is. It's just all one beautiful way to live just different kind of reflections of something and um yeah yeah i think i think that's awesome um you know i know you know just just sharing an experience i guess is we, we often talk about in our our firm exit advisory group you know we often talk about a lot of us being corporate skps and you know we've all worked in banking and accounting and all this sort of traditional stuff and um and there's a kind of a common theme amongst amongst the people who work in our team that we all hated this concept of having to wear different masks and it felt disingenuous and i it, it actually consumes a lot of energy trying to be something that other people want you to be rather than who you are naturally um and so i i, I really relate to what you're saying there um my question i guess and and, and maybe it's somewhat an obvious one but i I wonder how much you put down your success in your law practice to finding maybe that kind of balance. Yeah. And I think it's beautifully said. And first thing is I, 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 I mentioned as soon as I met you that you just had an authenticity about you. So, you know, we like to say, we want to talk from it, not about it. And so I just want your listeners to know that you are talking from it, you know, in my, in my not so humble opinion, as a student of human nature that you are truly talking from a point of authenticity and not just about authenticity. Um, yeah, the other thing I want you. to mention before, before I try to remember the question you asked me is, 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 as I heard a very wise man say, inauthenticity is exhausting. It is exhausting. That's what, that's exactly what you, it takes so much work to not be authentic. And, and after a while, <laughs> it's just not worth it. And you find yeah. out that you're, you know, all these idiosyncrasies, and maybe this this is touching on your question, and if not, you know, go back and ask it again, because I have forgotten it, <laughs> is, is that we think that the thing, the parts of ourselves that we need to hide, the parts of ourselves that won't be acceptable or palatable or marketable, or that'll be, that'll scare off an, a potential suitor of our companies or whatever it is, is actually, that's the differentiator. That's the, that's, yeah. that, that, that's it. 
and this is so much what I, you know, I feel so lucky to have discovered this and to be able to, to, you know, like when you, when you shake your head and say, Hey, you and I are from the same planet, you know, we know, <laughs> we understand that this is actually our superpower and we spend our whole lives trying to be something that we're not hiding what is our greatest gift. And it's exhausting. And, you know, in my own case, it was truly, you know, it was <laughs> at 62, finding the love of my life that finally I, I said, well, hell, if this beautiful, spiritual, you know, intelligent, tremendous woman loves me, I must not be this. I'm, maybe I'm not such a bad guy after all. Maybe I <laughs> my whole life trying to be the kind of man that would attract a woman like that. And she loved me in spite of all that crap. She loved me. <laughs> And, and I found that to be true in my business, that what makes me, you know, and the way it makes you successful, it's you. It's not, you know, I've had this situation, remember we, and actually the, the, the uh, kind of the, that we get to the software company, it was a, it was started off as something else. And I was in a, we were in New York. My, my partner at the time was a whiz kid. And he was the first vice president of sales and marketing at MTV and arts and entertainment. He made all these we go to New York to sell this concept and we're making the rounds in Manhattan. And, and I remember my, my partner got up and he went to the bathroom and, and I said to the guys, well, what do you think? He said, I don't know about your business, but I want him. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what it is. People want yeah. him or people want her. They want that. They want that authenticity. They want that power. So I don't yeah. know if I answered your question, if you want to ask it again. Whether well, it, no, I think, I think you did, but it's, it's, you know, I'm, I'm, reminded of another saying that we seem to uh kick around a lot in our in our kind of team and family is that you know in simple terms you, your vibe attracts your tribe right and um you know i'm reminded of simon cynic's comments too about you know your, your actual goal is not to go out there and try to sell stuff to everybody out there your goal is simply to be who you are and connect with those who believe what you believe and then you'll have a natural authentic connection and you don't need to sell to people. They will want to just work with you. So I want to tell you a funny story. I mean, it, we should just shut the podcast. That, you know, anything, <laughs> else, anything else we add on here, I said it's like painting a mustache on the Mona Lisa. It's perfect. <laughs> you just shut up. Okay. <laughs> I to tell you a funny story. And, and um, again, who knew where this was going to go? But I, as I mentioned to you, I'm, I am turning 70 uh, in, uh, in just a few days. And I would just say the, the, the vibrancy and the youthfulness you have is, is a tribute to the way that I live. And I don't say that immodestly. I just say that I'm, my life's just beginning. Every part of my life just feels like it's just because I'm living the way that you, we're living the way that we live. And it's, it's endlessly refreshing and reinvigorating. And I would even say resurrect. It's almost like something. But anyway, and my, my is like, I don't, I'm a hard guy to buy stuff for because I just don't have a lot, you know. Five years ago or ten years ago, when I smoked cigars, oh, he's got one thing. Let's all buy him cigars. You know, <laughs> there's not that many things that I want, and I'm, you know, I, I, I'm very pleased with what I have. And I, and my, and I said, Julie, I know what I want for my 70th birthday, and, and she's just taken up ceramics again. And I said, I want a, a begging bowl. I want you to to craft me a begging bowl. And I said, not because I want to, I want to beg, because I don't. So I said, I don't want to sell anymore. <laughs> I've been a trial lawyer. I had a sales company. I I know I can you you and I both. I know you and I together. <laughs> you us we could you and I could sell anything. I have absolutely no doubt. I want to do it. But the begging bull is that I want to just trust life the way a Buddhist monk goes out in the morning with his bull and just trust that life will bring him the right stuff. This is now you know this this is how I want to live my life. This is just exactly yeah. what you're meeting the people I'm supposed to meet, and it's an interesting model because at the same time I got bills to pay. You know, and, yeah. and, you know, it's funny when I, when I started this kind of mentoring business, the transformational mentoring, I said, eh, I'd like 10 clients. I got 10 clients without marketing. I had the guy that yeah. came in to get the mice out of our crawl space. He, you know, everybody that walked in the door. So, you know, and that, that worked for a while and then it didn't work. And so, you know what? Okay. I'm going to have to make some outreach. So, you yeah. know, the interesting thing, and I, and, and I'll, I'll wrap this up because I can go on for a long time is that. <laughs> Is that somehow it's like, how do we live our highest values in the world? And, and that isn't a problem. That is heaven on earth. Heaven yeah. on earth is how do the highest aspirations, the highest intuitions, everything that we, we experience, what does it look like? And it's not 
stepping it down. It's not bastardizing it. It's not, you know, whatever. It's not dehumanizing it. It's the opposite. It's actually where the human and the divine intersect is where heaven on earth is. And so this gets very practical in terms of how we run our businesses. Because yeah. you know, I, one of my one of my mottos for a previous business, a previous iteration of this was that it was shamelessly spiritual and ruthlessly accountable. Both of those things. I wanted to have the integrity. I wanted to have absolute integrity with ruthless accountability. So that is, and and it's it's a just you know to me, I, I I think you know it's the second piece of a Mona Lisa, just a piece of success is to be able to live our highest values with best business practices at the same time. Yeah, I I love that, and and thank you for sharing. It, it's. It, it very much resonates with me, and I, I, I do think though, and I, I think there's going to be people who will hear us chatting now and be wondering sometimes, how, well, how do I tap into that? How do I actually work out what that means to me? And um, maybe if I, if I can share a, an analogy from my please, own life is, um, you know, I had lots of different experiences, you know, corporate this and that and ran businesses and whatnot. But, um, you know, I still had this moment um, prior to actually doing what we're doing today, um, prior to this business where I had this almost almost like a little mini crisis of, well, what do, what do I actually really want with my life? And I was one of those kids, you know, and I'm still a kid, but just in an older man's body now. But <laughs> um who, who kind of believed my parents when they said, you can do anything you want. And that actually gave me a whole different problem because now I went, oh, my goodness, now there's so many things I, I, I to, to choose from. I don't know what to, to pick. And <laughs> so it created its own issues. But I read a really interesting book. Um, so back in 2015, I quit my corporate job. I'd finished my MBA. I was trying to buy a business, couldn't find one that fit the bill. So my wife and I, we packed up our house. We took our kids out of school and we just traveled around Asia for a year and and just spent time together because I'd been on this massive treadmill and I was just, an, I was not, I was happy. I love my family. I'm thankful and grateful for my life, but I was, I didn't feel like I was doing that higher purpose work. I, I hadn't found my groove and and combine that with this complication of, well, come on, you can do anything. Well, yeah, okay. But, <laughs> and so I read this book, which was aptly named, I could do anything I want if only I knew what it was. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it was a great, great book. But, you know, the thing about that book is you go through all that and you're doing these exercises to kind of get to the heart of what's important to you as a human. And one of the big things is actually describing like how you spend your time, you know, and, and it really has very little to do with the things that you have or the money you've got. It was like, what do you, where do you, where do you spend your time? What activities do you do? What people are around you? Because at the end of the day, like, and I've no, never been a, I need to drive a Ferrari kind of, I've never been that kind of guy. Um, but when my wife and I also sat down and did collective kind of little activities because hey, we're all individuals, but we're also a family. Um, we didn't have any of these things of, I want this or I want that. It was, I would really like to experience that one day. I would like to walk here and I want to have these relationships. I want to I have people around me that make me feel like this. And, and that was actually how we ended up describing our life and what we were trying to achieve. And then it actually the question sort of started coming into well what do you want to do for business it actually started being more centered around how can we help people how can i get that feeling <laughs> which actually can be a little bit selfish right like i actually want to feel good but i feel good by helping other people <laughs> well i just i i i don't know you and i should go into business together <laughs> because we are a kick ass team i've got to tell you <laughs> I'm giving a program next week to some founders. Company, I'm probably very similar to the people here, and it's and I call it the three keys to enlightened decision making. And you just nailed the first one. And the first one is, and it's actually a bit of wisdom my father shared with me. He said, "How does a decision make me feel?" That is actually how I live my life. I I just run through. I saw you. I saw your. I thought. That made me feel. That guy makes me feel good. Now, 
the, th- the reason that most people either cannot or should not run that experiment, do not or should, is you, know, you, know, some, it, you have to be trustworthy to yourself. Because it can make me feel, you know, the collection basket goes by in church. It might make you feel good and take 10 bucks. You know, that's not what we're talking about. That's not what you did. What you and your wife did was a totally different journey. It was a hero's journey. as a hero and a heroine's journey of you figuring out what your life was about. What meant something to me? How did the how did how did these seemingly you know asynchronistic and idiosyncratic you know I could use a bunch of big words how do these random events that happen in my life at, you know what is the pattern and where is it leading me to? And then once once you feel that that journey once that once you feel the path under your feet, then you can just trust. How does that how does it make me feel? And what a way to live, you know. And and I think it kind of answers your question. I think you've answered the question. You're, you know, that you were asking, we've answered it, is that how does it, you know, that's just how does this decision make me, how does it, how does that make me feel energetically? Am I sufficiently aligned with myself that I know that? And it scares the hell out of us because we, it bypasses the mind. Okay. Now, look, you know, I, I say to a lot of my clients, hey, I'm going to be your backstop. If you tell me that what makes you feel best is to give all your money away and go on the begging bowl and feed up. No, no, I'm going to say no, 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 no. That's that's not a good idea. So you want you know the mind has its proper place, but there is such a power in that heart. There's such a power in that. And then if I can add that the second one, which you also touched upon in terms of lightning, is is this mind to do? That's the second question that I ask myself. Is this mind to do? There's a lot of things that we can all do, right? There's so many things that mean things to us, that touch us, but it's not mind to do. Right, it's just not. It's somebody else's to do. It's, I, I would like to see it happen, but it's not mine. And I think that's, I think that's the process. And then I'll, I'll give you the third, as long as what the hell, you know, I've already given you two. Yes, yeah, please. Why, why, why do these people in suspense? So how does a decision make me feel? Is this mine to do? And the third one would sound, you know, probably like a Hallmark. I don't know if you have Hallmark cards over there in Australia, but you know, being very, you know, just kind of a shallow feel good kind of thing, except. It just happens to be true. Is that what is the most loving? What is the most loving decision I can make in the next moment? Or most loving choice that I can make in the next moment? And that loving choice could be very, could be tough. It could be firing. You know, it could, I had a partner in this in this iteration, of this business was who was uh, embezzling, and the most loving thing I could do was kick his ass out, lawyer up. You know. That's what I needed to do to maintain the integrity of everything that was in there. But yeah. literally to just feel, and I know you do that. I can just see it in your face. You know, we may not do it consciously, but this, the, the biggest impediment to this, and I know we'll talk about selling companies in a minute, but I, I got to give the punchline here is that we, we don't, we don't really like ourselves. <laughs> Most of yeah. us really don't like ourselves. And we we disqualify ourselves, we sabotage ourselves, we feel we're not ready for success. You know, probably the biggest thing that both of us do is just get people out of their own way, whatever their narrative is of why they're not ready, why they're not deserving, why success will destroy them, why they just got to take one more course, one more degree, one more promotion. Yeah. And and that is like that is like this Lot, like this white noise that drowns out all that intuition, that voice yeah. inside your head that says, "No, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm not, I'm not ready yet. What about this? You know, what about, what about this? I still have the toilet seat up. Oh my God, yeah. you know, I can't, yeah, yeah, I can't possibly be the man she wants to marry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, I, yeah, completely understand, and 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 still have those moments, right? Like, and for, yeah. fortunately, I have a a partner as well. You know, my wife, who I can. You know, I can say to her at times, like, I, I, I just feel, you know, d- disappointed with myself or I feel frustrated or I feel, you know, I'm, I, you know, and, and invariably your partners are good at actually going, well, you're probably being a little bit either too harsh or, or give it to you between the eyes and say, well, you know what? I agree. You probably shouldn't have done that. <laughs> so, you know, I think having, having that person, whether they are your life partner or your business partner or just a good friend, you know, um, you know, I, I think it's just so important, but, um, but, you know, I, I, I want to come almost full circle and yes, we'll talk about other businesses and stuff, but 
you know, this idea that being in or is it inauthentic or unauthentic? Jeez, I, I think, think it's inauthentic. I think. Inauthentic. Being in, yeah. Being inauthentic is is so um, consumes so much energy. It's exhausting, right? And I and that that whole point. I think if you can start to get a little aligned around yourself and who you are and what is your, you know, fundamentally your your purpose, then it life gets a lot easier. And I kind of chuckle a little bit because, you know, we all have different skills and we're all good at certain things and not good at other things. And, you know, we kind of chuckle in our team because I, I talk a lot, as you probably can tell already. <laughs> and, uh, and when I'm going to events and I might be speaking or I might be doing stuff or I'm even coming to a meeting, I mean, other than understanding who I'm talking to and why we're there, I don't really do any other work. It's, and, and people are looking at me going, aren't you going to prepare for this talk? Like, aren't you nervous? I'm like, no, like, I don't need to prepare because we're just going to talk about what's in here and what's in here. Sorry, pointing to the heart and the head. Um, I, I don't need to preempt this. I, I actually, the, my job is to go to this meeting and give this person my full attention so that I can understand what it is that we can do to help. And if I'm thinking about what's in my head and how I can try to position things, that's really inauthentic and I'm going to struggle and that's, that's when I'm going to get stressed out. <laughs> Yeah, you you know, it's a long way of saying you just show up and you're just being yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. See, I told you I talk too much. <laughs> no, it's beautiful. No, it, I mean, I'm just, you just sound like me, which I don't know. You know, I, I was talking to my my stepdaughter left for Italy on Thursday, and I wrote her a really sweet note, and I said, you know, I think our love for each other is just a a kind of a, a form of narcissism because we just see ourselves so much in the other, we can't help but love each other. <laughs> 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 so, mm. <laughs> but you, so, you said it yeah. well because when when you are being yourself you can just respond to life yeah and that's what and that's the confidence you have you're just going to respond you know and, and if we weren't aligned i wouldn't i you know i don't maybe i would anyway but the point is you are just being yourself and when you're being inauthentic which all of us you know and it's no crime it's not like it's not yeah. Not a hanging offense, as we say here in the states. It's it's just the way it's it's it, these are natural survival mechanisms that we come up with. But trying to remember who the hell we're pretending to be and how that person is going to act in this moment and what this what this is expected of you is yeah, it's just such a waste of time. And yeah, you know, and for you, I just feel like this whole thing with the buy sell. That's just your Trojan horse to tell give people beautiful life wisdom. I think it's I think it just happens to be the you know whatever just the vehicle that you're using because this is you know and and it does get to 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 building something that has value because that's what you're doing. You want to build something that has value, not just value to the marketplace, but as a reflection of your internal values, which can't help but have value. And then yeah. it's attractive. Couldn't agree more. So, so let me let me change gears if if you don't mind. Um, you know, we we talked I know just just sort of off air before about these kind of pivotal moments um, that people have, and 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 you know, yes, personal life but business life as well. Um, can I ask? You know, you built this law practice up. I believe it was fifteen odd years, so that's a fair amount of time. I mean. When did you start having thoughts around, you know, selling and that there was a change coming? I wasn't going to tell this story, but now I have no choice because <laughs> it, it, you know, it, it is so particular to me that I don't know if it has, you know, how, where, the, where the life lesson is for everyone else. But I'll give you the story behind the story, which is that I'm, I am about 35. I'm at the peak. I'm, I, I ran eight miles to work. And this is West Virginia, so it's all hills. You know, I was at the peak of my health and the peak of my, and I was, I was at a very, very difficult case that I was in the middle of. That was also a case where I was, I was on the good guy side. And um, there was, I noticed when I got to work that my eyes didn't line up, like my one eye was going this way. And without going through all the things, so this is like at, at noon, by noon the next day, I was diagnosed as having a, a, tumor behind my left eye which would kill me within six months oh wow 
And um, I laid, I was sent down and I was on, on a cat, I was laying on a cat scan table and I asked myself two questions. And I'll tell you, when you get that kind of a shock, you, you know, here I was a seeker of the truth, but I was bullshitting myself until this moment. I, you know, I never really wanted the truth as much as I wanted in that moment where I don't care. I'm going anyway. Let's get, the, let's get the straight stuff before I, before I check out of this place. And the first question I asked was about, you know, is this the end? What, you know, is it, what happens when they, which I won't get into that right now. But the second yep. question was, what do, I, what do I regret? And it's such an interesting question to ask. Because I don't, I don't think the idea of going ahead twenty years and thinking what we'll regret now to me, it just seems like a mental. I think you're going to get lost in some ideas, and you know, it just it doesn't feel authentic to me. I mean, it might be for someone else, but but in that moment, it was authentic. And I, what I was, I wanted to write a book about this teacher because I felt he was such a phenomenal man, but he's so irascible and just such a. I, I don't know how much language I'm like. He was, he was, he was, <laughs> but, and so. You know, I thought, wow, it's so many things. I, you know, not that I never had a family, or not that I didn't do this, or not that I didn't get enlightened, or you know, no, I said I didn't write this book. And so then they take this tumor out of my eyes, and at the time I, I was standing on my head an hour a day, and I had a little tumor, and it blew up, and I mimicked the tumor, and I was fine. And but I, I got that message, like, oh my God, this is what I, was, I got. I got a reprieve, you know, and. Um, and so I just set out right to write this book, and I couldn't do it. And then after a few years, I thought, well, look, next time God's not shooting blanks, and I use God metaphorically, and I don't, I don't want to sure. offend anybody here, but you know, the, the universe is not going to give me another another one of these. I got the message now. Hang up the phone and get on with it. And so I just sold my practice. And as it turned out, in retrospect, it was time for me to move. That I had outlived. I had, you know, now. I, one of my bits of advice is put no man or woman's voice above your own. You know, I, I, I spent 40 years of my life in surrendered relationships with people that I thought were. And yeah, it taught me about as much humility as a high strung, you know, over anxious, you know, ego, which I could have, you know, but for the most part, I, I, I was done, you know, it was time for me to go out and become my own man. And, and, yeah. and pursue a different destiny, and so that that prompted me to to do the sale. And you know, the nice thing is those my two partners that I started with, one in 1978 and one in 1981, are two my my two best friends. They both retired, you know, with their health and marriages and healthy, healthy bank accounts and great reputations, and the law firm is still there. So I was able to get out and still leave a legacy, and um, yeah, so that's that's kind of what, and I think, you know, we were talking a little bit as I was thinking about, and I didn't know how, what the level of depth I would be met with, and I'm like, well, how can I sneak this in? But now I don't have to sneak it in. <laughs> um, when one is thinking about selling a company, it is just part of a, the word montage comes, but I don't even know if it's a real word or if it's, it's, it's just part of the whole, the whole spectrum of events that's happening in the moment. It's not, right. an, you know, people think, I want to build a company. I want to sell the company, you know, whatever found, build and sell. And yes, okay. But it's it going to be in the context of your, of some bigger, bigger part of your life. And that's where the yeah. elegance comes. And, and it's also the key, I think, to everything is why, why success doesn't destroy men like us and people like us. What well, does destroy uh, others? Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm fascinated. I'd like to sort of pick at that a little bit because. You know, what you've just described there was this fundamental, you know, moment. Like you, when you're questioning your own mortality, I, I imagine, um, you know, I've had a few scary moments in my life where I actually thought I could have died and, and I certainly wasn't thinking about how much money I could make and stuff like that, right? So I, I imagine in that moment, you're not thinking about business and money and growth and whatever. Um, but, but having said that, I think when you, you mentioned before, people go, oh, I'm going to start a company, I'm going to sell it, I'm build to sell, blah, 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 blah. I do think a lot of that kind of thinking is is financially driven, right? Like it's it's about what will this experience give me? I'm going to build this big thing and then I will have stuff. I will be able to do things, right? It's, uh, you know, and, and, I, and I'm not suggesting that there's anything wrong with that. You need to have motivations and you've got to be clear about what you want in life. And, and you know, desiring a good life is not a, not a hanging offence either. Um, but, 
But I do wonder, I do wonder, you know, there's going through something like building and selling a company is, in my mind at least, about more than just money. I mean, if if it's only about money, I think you're possibly missing some of the really deep experiential things that you can actually learn about yourself and life because you are putting yourself through an experience that most people will, you probably haven't been through before and most a lot of people won't experience at all and so you know can you step out of the kind of mantra and the 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 pot of gold kind of mentality for a second to actually i don't know pull that apart a little bit mentally and ask yourself how you feel about it well, there's so much there. I don't. Even, I'm gonna. I forgot the first three of the things I had from what you said. But no, oh, I, I remember it. <laughs> it's good. I, the first one is that the great piece of wisdom that I've received, uh, been exposed to, is that you you want to start from where you want to finish. Yeah. So if you're starting from scarcity, if you're starting from lack, if you're part, you're starting that I. That's where you're going to end up, no matter how much money you have, no matter what you get. Yeah. So. So much of your of you talk about motives is one way of looking at it. It's a little bit more subtle though, and maybe a little bit more simpler too. It's just that if I'm stuck, I I didn't build that practice to make a lot of money. I didn't build it to become a you know a renowned trial attorney or or any, I'm sure you know my ego ran and loved all that stuff. It wasn't like yeah, I was, yeah. you know, pure, but but I I did it to be a service. I just did it to be a service, and I did it because it was mine to do. And, and I was yeah. too stupid to know it couldn't be done. I'm like, those, <laughs> like the rookies in the Super Bowl here in the States or whatever, you know, your World Cup. They just don't know enough to be scared. So so anyway, that's that's just something that if, if you think you're going to success your way out of suffering, it doesn't work. Yeah. So yeah. how do we start from a, from, a, from a place of wholeness? You know, that that's another story, but I think that's yeah. part of what you're saying. So this is, yeah. go ahead. No, I think that's I think that's really fascinating. You you reminded me of another podcast guest we had um, who was saying to me he just that uh, you know putting a business context on the same concept, but he said I I thought we would just scale through our problems, <laughs> and I thought and of course we were chuckling at the time and he goes like how stupid is that right like is I, I little did I think at the time that if I just keep scaling on the back of problems I probably just have bigger problems <laughs> so um, so yeah I think it's. Uh, you're right. I don't think you could. You can't necessarily just trade out of problems. You got to work it out what they are and what what is the actual solution. Yeah, and I and I think part of it too is just what you were saying is just true for all of life. Is that we set these arbitrary goals that are mostly externally informed, like oh, I'm going to sell a company, you know, like I'll be like this person and I'll sell and I'll have that behind me and and um. <laughs> I'm going to finish it, and I hope I remember. But, but that event that you're missing the event. Yeah, you're totally. You're not alive. I had a yeah. young man tell me. I, I I never forgot this. I asked him why he came to a lecture that I was promoting for someone else, and he said, "Dave, I don't taste the experience of my own life." And I thought, how wise we're selling a company, and we're not tasting the experience of what it's like. We may be, you know, <laughs> that's a nice way to say it. We we may be scared to death, you know. We yep. may have all these, but in terms of actually experience the wonderment of what's going on, whether it is as big as selling a company or whether it's just, you know, whatever it is. And you know, it's interesting too on that front because my, I, you know, I talk about how I wanted to become this guy that could that could attract a woman like my wife, which again is you know the foolishness of it. I can laugh at it now, but she said. I'm not interested in your resume points. We're trying to get resume points. And the people who are going to love us don't give a damn about our resume points. You know, yeah. Julie said, I couldn't figure out why Julie, why this beautiful woman could love this older, you know, kind of funny looking guy like me. And she said, Dave, I love you for good reasons and no good reasons. And you're going to be loved and accepted and appreciated and welcomed and, you know, connected for no good reasons. And the, it's going to be your energy, just like I saw when I saw you, it's going to be your energy that's going to get you what, what it is that you want. And, hey, if, if it's your destiny to go out and you want to go out and, you know, and 10X your life and make all this money and sell these companies, do it. That's fine. Just do it. But don't expect that to fill the hole that 
can only be filled when you fill it with, fully with yourself. Yeah. And you really accept and love yourself and live a life that's in accordance with your your highest value and your your, your deepest longings. Yeah. I I have nothing to add. It's I I think that's beautiful <laughs> and I think it's spot on. <laughs> So, so let me ask, Dave. You know, you've gone through this amazing experience, and no doubt, you know, given you a, a window into life and and the universe that that perhaps you hadn't looked through before. You obviously evolved here, and you've developed, and you've gone into another business. And just to make it, you know, give you no doubt some more rich experiences, you've gone completely something completely out of your field, <laughs> um, and something is obviously very, very topical these days too. You know, but but a software company back around two thousand. I mean, you don't have to be as old as myself or you to remember a dot com bust and all the rest of it. So, can, can well, tell us a bit about that. <laughs> Well, this was so funny because we sold in April of 2000, which was like the bust that happened, but nobody knew, you know? <laughs> yeah. And by the way, you know, it's a great success story in that way. But another way, I, I, we were relatively unsophisticated and we ended up getting crammed down by the preferred, you know, by the new investors to the point that even though we had this, you know, we, by the time they kept bring, had to bring in new rounds and new rounds and new rounds, we still, the percentage of our, the value of our, our shares went down. You know, it was still a nice, a nice exit, but just, you know, I, w- I wish I could tell you that we were just so brilliant and we did so, we, we did well, but yeah. we didn't. First, can, can, can I ask you, sorry to cut across, Please. when you say cram, crammed down, can, can you define that a little bit more for me? But like, just, 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 what do you mean by that? Sure. So what it is, is that they, is they would bring in, so we, we own such a percentage of the company, but as they were getting new investors in and because, right, because the market had crashed and investment money was at a premium and they were able to get the terms that they wanted, it would happen is our percentage just kept getting cut and cut and cut. And the, the, new, the new people that came in with the preferred shares or the preferred interest were, were getting a much bigger share of the company than we were. Sure. So, gotcha. And, and I just, I wasn't that sophisticated, you know, at the time to know what the hell, you know, I, it's funny. I did the, I did the negotiations. It was an Israeli company. And, and I said, this they could have put us the negotiations on that could have been on pay per view because I you've got this on the one and you got this Israeli guy and you got this Jewish lawyer on the other and it was really quite I enjoyed but enjoying it I really enjoyed that I I had a great by the way a great line that he told me because you know in Israel everyone goes in the army and um and I asked for something you know you got to ask for something ridiculous so they can throw it off the table and it's really yeah, yeah. and I asked for something ridiculous and I said hey listen. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to say, you know, I, I got to ask for it. And we, we say in the States that if you don't ask, you don't get. And he said, oh, he said in the Israeli army, we say, if you don't ask, you don't eat. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he got it. But um, anyway, two, two interesting things about that, I would just say is life lessons that kind of, you know, within the higher framework or the deeper framework that we're going into today. And the first is we didn't start off as a software company. We start off with some some crazy idea. I, I invested some money in it. I just sold my practice. I was in the process of writing the book. This friend said, come on, give me six months and X amount of dollars. And I did. And it was a total failure. And there were four of us. We're all single. We're sitting in a room in our office, such as it was in, in the Washington, D.C. area, capital area of the country. Yeah. And, and they said, what do we do now? I said, we're four smart guys. We'll think of something. And we left DC and we ended up in Raleigh, North Carolina, where I, in the area that I live now. And our company was Raleigh Group. It was named after the city we were in. And we just started hustling. And I put together a deal. Some guy was buying six supermarkets that I, you know, and we were just hustling every which way. Just, you know, what is it? What is it? What is it? What is it? And we ended up actually repping. The, um, we were reselling some friends of ours, because uh, the same time we're doing this, we're also running these spiritual groups on, you know, yeah. you know I always had this crazy double life. And so, so, and and I, I was trying to, I was going to ask you just there and I'm jumping in again, so apologies, but I was going to say, so what, just for the people who are listening, I guess, what, what, what did Raleigh Group do? Like what, what how did it, what did it start? Well, what was the value from? And, and the thing is, we did the, the, the last thing you want to do if you want to sell your company, we were resellers. Yeah. We, what the thing okay. is, we didn't sell anything. 
So we we would we sell, but what we would do, you know, we think, well, we need an exit strategy because no one's gonna, you know, all we're doing is guys on the phone making stuff happen. And and so we would take we entered into agreements where we would take a percentage of the companies. Okay. So we took a percentage of companies and then we started another model where we would partner, we would the guys that bought our the guys that we first started repping for were bought by Microsoft. And this is in ninety three when Microsoft was Microsoft, right? You know, yes. this was a big deal. And so we got, so they went into Microsoft and they're in there for three years and we're saying, what's the next thing that Microsoft is going to buy? They bought your company. What's the next part of that suite? And so we were looking to either partner with a company that had that product and take a piece, or actually we started another company to build that. And that's how we thought our exit strategy would be. But, oh, this is where the surprise comes in. We, there was an Israeli company that was about to go public on the Frankfurt Exchange of all places. And we were negotiating what our reseller agreement would be. And they said, huh, why don't we just buy you? <laughs> and then, and then, because they, they could then, what really what they were buying was a sales channel that they could take to the market and saying, we got to look at these guys. They can make anything happen. And it was yeah. mostly guys. We had a few, I know I say guys, I'm not being misogynistic. There weren't many women that could have survived that, that locker room mentality that we had there. It wasn't, yeah. it wasn't abusive. It was just very testosterone driven. Yeah. Um, but anyway, and so they, they decided to just buy us. And, um, and, and it was very fortuitous because I don't know whether we really had an exit strategy. And I think this is one thing that I've learned in the businesses, my own businesses and the people that I mentor in terms of, you know, starting from where you finish not only means starting from a place of wholeness, it means, hey, you know, you want it, you don't want to do this your whole life, probably. How the how do you get the hell out of it? So, you know, that's part of it, that's part of it as well. Um, so that's how that's ended up, you know, how we ended up selling the company. And yeah. um and then there's an interesting story if I if I can add it, because it kind of ties into the whole thing. Or you wanna you wanna I can say if you don't want to. No, okay. no, please come on. Can't teach people okay. like that. <laughs> this is this is no, no, I you know, this is supposed to be your podcast. You do hijack So um, this is fun. See, this is what this is what I want everyone to know. This is how you live. Two strangers yeah. off by the country. It's nine o'clock, ten, almost ten o'clock at night. I'm having a time in my life because we're just yeah. being ourselves. All right. That's anyway, it. enough. <laughs> so I was just thinking again in preparation. Well, preparation, just musing about what I might want to talk about if I was met with depth. You know, be, you met me with a depth beyond what I could depth beyond I could hope for, but. Like, why did I sell? Why do we sell the company? You know, why? The why? You know, I can, let's make the business case and blah, 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 blah. Yeah. You know, when we're making a resume course, resume point, of course, it's a business day. But interestingly enough, um, I got married late because I was living this ascetic kind of lifestyle. And then I finally got married. And my wife and I were both older and we ended up wanting to adopt. And we were very fortunate and adopted a newborn. We were, she was 20 hours old when, wow. when we, we would have been there if the if she had, the mother hadn't gone to labor early. Would have been there in the room at the delivery. But I got to be a father, and um, and I was under a three year personal service contract with this company. Like you know, as they normally do, they want to keep the <laughs> they what they thought was the brain trust, and they thought I was part of that brain trust uh, for for three years. And um, I remember that a friend of mine who had um, his wife had just had a baby. He sent me a picture of. Someone who was part of, you know, their Lamaze the group or whatever, and the child had Down syndrome, and it just and I had this beautiful baby, and he had this beautiful baby, and this picture, it just broke. You know how it is when you're father; it just breaks your, you know, you're so tender, you're so damn tender, and it just broke my heart. And I literally got out of my chair, and I walked out of the office, and I got in my car. And, you know, I, as I've mentioned, and as people who, if they could see me, they would know and maybe guess from my name, I am a Jewish, I was born Jewish. And I drove to, there was a synagogue, just happened to be a synagogue, you know, miles from the road. And I'm, I'm not, I wasn't practicing, I'm not, it's not my particular event, part of my heritage, but not my, my inclinations now. And I, I went into that synagogue, sure. got down on my knees, literally, and I just prayed. I said, God, let me be home with my daughter. I want, I, I am so grateful to have this, to have this chance and to see 
what it was. And this, it was totally spontaneous and totally surprised. And I got up and I went back into the office, got back on the phones, <laughs> of course. And, and the next day, the CEO, the next day, the CEO was, flew in from Israel and he takes me in his office and said, we want to offer you a buyout. Wow. And, and, you know, someone said, what are you going to do? I said, God called my bluff. What the hell am I going to do? You know, if God answers you, <laughs> you better go with yeah, it. Yeah. You know, you I think for it. <laughs> it. To me, you know, when I look at the, the, you know, like we talk about the hero's journey where your life starts to make sense. And it's something I would encourage everyone to muse or play about, whatever you call it, is that that was my time. It was my time. To, and I was able to yeah. spend the first four years, five years till my daughter went to kindergarten. Is a stay-at-home dad with her, and yep. that was, you know, absolutely priceless. That's nice. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Dave, I um, I, I get the sense that you and I could probably talk all day, um, <laughs> or all evening in your ca- as it is as it is in your case. But um, I'm I'm curious. Are you are, are you open to people reaching out to you? I um, I love seeing people connecting i know that there'll be a lot of people who are going to listen to this and and probably love to chat to you a little bit further so um are, are you okay with people reaching out to connect yeah of course and and i would say this and i i i noticed that there's a case this has been happening i don't want to make it seem like you're just the last date that i've had and all the ones have been great before and but you know that i just <laughs> noticed something you know, happening in, in these kind of connections and we've created a field our, our authenticity, just as inauthentic, inauthenticity is exhausting, authenticity is contagious. Yes. So the people that are listening right now are actually in a little different state than they were before. And I, I, I would just, yeah, they are. I mean, they might not know it. It might be some will be direct, some will be subtle, and some, you know, the wives look, what the hell's the matter with you or with, with husbands, whatever. But, but I would, I, I, first thing I do is use, this is a precious moment. And I'm not saying this immodestly, but just, do something, you know, do something authentic. Take some authentic step with this. Just don't waste this beautiful moment that the serendipitous moment, the synchronistic moment that happened. So yes. And two, if what, if what I say resonates with you, whether it's with, with working with your company or with your business or just with yourself, what I, what I, as I was just explaining, I'm working on my, my website. Of course, people, my wife says, yeah, what else is me? But, but I, I just, I, what I wrote was that, I I had everything, you know. I I was a, a business success, you know, even a spiritual success. I ended up having some revelations, which were quite satisfying, and and you know, as part of what you feel in me now. I'm, I don't claim to be some spiritual giant, but I would be, you know, I'd be disingenuous to not, you know, be express my gratitude and appreciation for those things. But I was never happy. I just wasn't happy, and it, it wasn't until I was sixty-two years old. Before I can enjoy the fruits of everything that I'd be, and I don't want people to wait sixty-two years. I don't. Or if they're seventy, I don't. I don't want them to wait eighty years. I just want. Yeah. Come on, you know, you don't have to live. You can. You can be successful. There's a different way for success. There's a different way to live. And and I want to tell one more little thing. Thank you. Open and I will shut up and walk. I'll go to bed and we'll go to work or whatever. Oh, good. I'm not going. To, I'm too wound up now. My poor wife. But anyway, <laughs> um. Is I, I, one of my clients wise, I, we, I've actually uh, helped two of my clients start a business together. And then I'm, I've come in, in a, in a role with them as well. And we had an open house and I met his wife and his wife said, you changed. My, my husband's a different person. My marriage is so much better. He's such a better father. And I, and I was saying, if, if you won't transform and stop beating yourself up for no good reason for yourself, do it for the people you love. Whether it's with me or with you, I don't care who it's with. If it's with me, it resonates yet. Yeah. Dave at DaveGold.com. It can't get any simple. That's it. Dave Gold, D A V E G O L D. Dave, you know, you can find me there. Yep. And, and I would say again, you know, you're, you're a gem. You really are, Simon. I don't know all of what you do, but I just know the man. I can see the type of human being you are, and you are a beautiful blend of business genius and deep heart. Oh, and, well, thank you. I, the feeling's mutual. Yeah. And, and it's, yeah, we're one. We're, you know, we were separated at birth. Um, <laughs> Brothers from got, another mother. <laughs> I, got, I got a better head of hair, but you're a lot better looking. <laughs> it, 
anyway, that 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 whatever whatever it is that you provide in your suite of of offerings or services or whatever it is, I would just deeply encourage people to take advantage of this because this is rare. You know, I've been in business for fifty years and you know, there's a handful of people I've met like you that really have what you have and have the, the genius in the heart that you do. So yeah, I'm gonna plug myself, David Dave if this resonates with you, reach out. We'll see what happens. But I also just want to let people know something in their backyard that in, in your own space is, is equally as authentic and valuable and priceless. Uh, well, I appreciate the kind words. And yeah, it's, it's been an absolute pleasure to share this moment with you. And, and it certainly has left me feeling different and better and positive. And you know, it's, um, yeah, look, I, I think I'll, I'll certainly remember this moment and I'll share it, of course. So uh, for anybody listening, um, if you'd like to reach out to Dave, please do so. So davegold.com. We will put links in the show notes. Um, he's a beautiful man who's got a lot to share and will no doubt have a very big positive impact on your life. So Dave, thank you once again for coming on the show. I'm I'm really appreciative. I'm a lot of gratitude for you for you sharing your story and your background and your insights. Uh, thanks for the platform and thanks thanks for the you know my wife said something we we both came out of divorces when we met and it's a, that's another beautiful story because it, it's a love story that's even more amazing than anything I've said. But she said I I really like the version of myself that I'm when I'm with you, and that's the way I feel with you. I really like the version of myself that I'm with you, Simon, and I think that that's. It's another way to look at who you want to hang out with. So let's just leave it at that. Or you and I just keep loving on each other all night. And all <laughs> <gonna sleep. laughs> Thanks again, Dave. Much appreciated.